Books have always seemed like self-contained worlds to me. Pick up a book and you can transport yourself to any time in history, or the future for that matter. Delve into the mystical or the romantic. Books help us to open our minds and our hearts. And over the last 30 years, today's guest has put more of those books into hands than just about anyone else. He's Jonathan Karp, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Joining me from his home in Rhode Island is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Each week we talk about big issues with great guests, authors, journalists, artists, and more to make sense of the big stories that shape pub public life in the United States today. This week, we're joined by Jonathan Karp. A longtime veteran of the publishing industry, he is currently the president and CEO of Simon & Schuster, one of America's great publishing houses. John, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for inviting me. So you've had really a storied career in the publishing industry. Uh, I'm curious, though, how has the industry changed over the 30 years that you've been working in it? Well, obviously, digital dist distribution has been a big change, uh, moving from hardcovers uh, to uh, ebooks and, and digital audio. Um, uh, probably about 30% of our books now are, are in the digital format. So that's a change. I think that also the way people find out about books is a lot different. It used to be that uh, you would read about them in your local newspaper. Obviously, that's changed, and uh, people are hearing a lot more about them online. Does that, does that, does that, lack of sort of local local validators of it i mean is, is that how does that relate to sort of the online there are there are virtual book clubs uh, all over the place there are podcasts about books um how have those sort of new digital innovations changed the way people talk about books think about books hear about books at first i was concerned because i remember when i got into publishing they would circulate a clip file and it would be so thick with all the things that people all over America had written about our, our authors. And, um, and as, you know, through the 90s and then the 2000s, that file would get thinner and thinner and thinner and there'd be less book coverage. Um, but now I realize that if you look at everything that influencers are saying about our books and, and, uh, and online reviewers, it's, the file is just as thick. We just don't, um, we just don't print it out anymore. Um, and uh, and people really have become very influential online, uh, and and booksellers are talking about books through their websites. I mean, if you actually added up all the booksellers with their websites and all of their followers, it would probably be bigger than the following of all the major book reviews. So let's get into publishing during the pandemic, because obviously that has had a dramatic effect on businesses, people, and and lives. And maybe we can go sort of category by category. Uh, start with print books. What what is happening? What has been happening in the last year with print? Obviously, soft cover and hard cover, things that you can actually hold and turn pages with. Well, uh, book sales are up, um, and uh, it's one of the uh, one of the strange ironies of the pandemic. Obviously, it's been a time of great hardship and suffering for a lot of people. A lot of those people have been home. A lot of them are looking for comfort or or guidance or escape and they're buying books they're buying a lot of books and they're buying them online they're buying them at big box retailers like target and walmart um, and uh, and they're also ordering them from independent bookstores online or they're picking them up curbside pickup but uh, it, it book sales have been up um our backlist sales are up and the reason why our backlist sales are up is because readers are going to what is familiar to them, what they already know about. So a lot of our best known titles are selling better than ever. Uh, so the book business is actually very healthy right now. So are you bringing some titles back into print or back into or into uh, e-editions or audio? Or are you just going with things that are already published and, and that you have uh, ready access to? 
Simon & Schuster publishes 2,000 new books a year. So we're definitely not just going with the tried and true, but the consumers are going to what they recognize. So we're reprinting a lot of um, a lot of books that um, that, that are older, but uh, we, they've never gone out of print. They've they've always stayed in print. I mean, for example, this is a strange story, but um, there's a there's a, a romance novel that we published in 2016 by a writer named Colleen Hoover, and it, it started to sell in huge quantities, and we couldn't figure out why. And it turned out that. Um, a bunch of young women had discovered it, and they were posting videos of themselves on TikTok crying. And a video of this one, one young woman crying on TikTok uh, uh, compelled us to print another 50,000 copies of Colleen Hoover's novel. So things like that happen that are just hard to understand, but, uh, but it's real. So uh, you know. I'll tell you a funny story. There was a New York Times story two weeks ago about this very phenomenon of TikTok and people crying, mostly young women crying to sell books. So as an author, I joined TikTok thinking that it might help sell my books. I, I did not cry and it has not moved my sales at all. So I think it's for a certain certain a clientele or a certain niche. Um, That's classic. Exactly. Hey, John, what, um, what gets published? You mentioned 2000 titles a year from Simon & Schuster. What gets published? Well, it has to do with what the editors uh, fall in love with or what they think is really interesting or intriguing. And uh, you know, we have probably over 100 people acquiring books for us, children's books, uh, books for adults. And, uh, and every day they come into work and they get email and they, they read it and whatever appeals to them, they, they live with it for a little while, they talk to their colleagues about it, and then we, we, we try to buy it if we, if we think it's compelling. So... For those in the audience who may not know what the president and CEO of a big publishing house does, give us just sort of a quick overview of, of what your responsibilities are and, and what your job entails. Well, uh, obviously, the decision about what to acquire, um, if, it, if it's at a high level, it comes to me. I supervise all of the publishers. Um, and uh, and all of the operations of the company, ultimately, um, distribution of the books, the marketing of the books, uh, any legal issues that arise. Obviously, we have a full executive team, and I'm not singularly responsible for any of these uh, categories. Uh, sales, um, the, the digital distribution, uh, basically everything that gets a book produced and into the hands of readers. Um, if you're the CEO of the publishing company, you are asking questions of your colleagues and you're, you're trying to help them uh, do the very best for our authors. Um, as I mentioned, there are about 2,000 books a year that are coming out from Simon & Schuster. So our ultimate responsibility is to make sure that each of those books um, finds its audience. You you're, uh, came up through the industry, as it were, as, as an editor. Uh, and I, I'm curious, how, how does that process work? How, what, what was, what's the day in the life like for an editor? Again, for those in our audience who might be uninitiated about the, about the workings of the publishing industry. Well, I guess I can just tell, I can answer that question with a story, with the story of the very first book I signed up, which amazingly uh, was written by Mr. G. Wayne Miller. <laughs> and uh, I had met, I'd met him when, uh, when we were both reporters at the Providence Journal. And when I got to Random House in 1989, he was one of the very first people I wrote to because he was the best writer at the Providence Journal. All the reporters knew that. He only wrote a few stories a year. He was that good. And when, and when they were published, they were really great. So uh, I wrote to him and, um, and he did eventually come up with an idea for a book. And I took it to my colleagues after I'd been at Random House for two and a half years. It was the very first project I'd asked them to sign up. It was a book about a children's hospital um, in Massachusetts and about a remarkable pediatric surgeon there named Hardy Hendren. And it was called The Work of Human Hands. And, um, and my colleagues, let me sign it up. I was probably about 28 years old at the time. They had no reason to think that I knew how to edit a book. They liked Wayne's proposal. Um, they thought that it would sell to Book of the Month Club. They thought that, that they, which is, that's how long ago this was. Book of the Month Club was a huge force in publishing, and they thought that um, medical stories had real appeal to that readership. So they let us pay in advance, uh, and, um, and Wayne, uh, Wayne accepted it. And, uh, and we did that book together. So that was the very first book I, I actually got to edit. 
It's well, a remarkable coincidence. It, 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 it is remar- and it's also a remarkable book. We should note, but I, you know, I, I was I was intrigued reading your account of working with Senator uh, Ted Kennedy uh, on his uh, autobiography because I sort of had this mental image in my mind of sort of the the, the editor uh, with the red pen in their hand, sort of like dripping like blood from their fingertips, and sort <laughs> of the carcasses of manuscripts lying at their feet, as well as the darker side of editing, right? And but the, the the portrayal that you gave us in that uh, in that that New York Times magazine essay about working with Senator Kennedy is you were really present at the creation. How usual is that uh, to work with an author quite that closely? Each book is different, and uh, in that case, um, Senator Kennedy um, was uh, he'd been diagnosed with. Um, uh, with the glioblastoma so he he knew that he had limited time and so i was more involved in some of the interviews with him um getting it all down on paper and 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 talking to him and trying to trying to um help him tell the story uh, but there were other people involved and and obviously his wife vicky uh kennedy extraordinary woman uh she really um she was integral to the project as well and um and and Ron Powers, um, the collaborator, also helped out a lot. So there were a lot of people, um, and um, and my role was was mostly just to um, ask all the questions I could think of that readers would want to know. I kind of feel like you know an editor can edit what's in the book, but sometimes what's more important is what is not on the pages um, and what's between the lines. And so I was I was very interested in that, and I had a lot of questions for him. So we wanted to get into uh, many more, or at least as many as we can, of, of your other books. But before we do, it, it, can you say anything about the proposed merger of Simon & Schuster and Penguin Random? Sure. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a great thing. I mean, and uh, Penguin Random House is, um, is, a, is obviously uh, one of the most respected uh, publishing companies in the world. And um, we're still owned by Viacom CBS, uh, which uh, is um, interested in pursuing more of a strategy in streaming and broadcast. And so we're going to get to be owned by a publishing company now, and um, a publishing company that has been publishing books going back to the 1600s in Germany. So wow. it, it's a, it's a good it's a good thing for Simon and Schuster. And uh, right now the um, the sale is being reviewed by the Department of Justice, and so I can't really uh, speak about it with any kind of specifics. But but we're hoping that um, it will it will go through smoothly. And um, when the deal was done, uh, people expected uh, the lawyers expected that it would take most of this year. So that's still where we are on it. So well, let's get go ahead, go Jim. Ahead. I was gonna say, let's get into some of the books that you've published in your career. Uh, the, one of the one of the titles that leapt uh, to my mind was "Born to Run," uh, the Bruce Springsteen autobiography. What was it like working with the boss? It was one of the most expi- inspiring experiences of my life, actually, um, because I saw how a true artist works. And um, you know, Bruce spent six or seven years writing the manuscript himself. Obviously. Uh, there was a writer who did not need a book advance from a publisher. He was able to support himself um, without without needing any of our money. So he he wrote it on his own terms in his own way. And one day, when I was actually uh, sitting in my apartment reading, I, I'd taken a week off. I was I was on vacation in my apartment. I got a call from his uh, manager, John Landau, who said, "Would you like to read Bruce's memoir?" Um, and I said yes, and uh, so I immediately headed over to their lawyer's office, which was conveniently, uh, you know, a few blocks away. And I spent the next two days in his lawyer's office reading the manuscript. I was the only person uh, in New York who got to read it, and um, and we made a, a preemptive offer and uh, and wound up as the publisher. But um, but the uh, the the work itself was was meticulously crafted. Then what was really amazing is that. Then Bruce decided he wanted to spend a year on the editing. So um, I gave him my notes. We met, we had conversations. And over the course of a year, he revised, he cut it. Um, unlike a lot of uh, writers, he, he, was, he was really um, very clear-eyed about uh, cutting stuff. He, he, he had that kind of um, dispassion about his work, which is rare. Um, so there were no arguments at all. He just made it better and better. He honed it. 
And um, I, I remember, um, you know, I remember going to, after the book came out, um, he invited me to his Broadway show, which was based on the book. And he, he kept cutting actually, to the extent that um, on opening night, some of the same stories that were in the book were, were told even better. And then he invited me again to closing night and closing night was different from opening night um, because he was just relentless about shaping the material and having it achieve its, its, um, you know, its maximum impact. So uh, I got to see his relentlessness um, his focus, you know, he spent a year just writing the song Born to Run. And that's only three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's a little longer than that. It's probably more like five. But um, it's uh, so he's he's a great artist. And I loved working with him. So talk about fear in Bob Woodward, another one of your major, uh, major titles. Yeah, well, Bob Woodward uh, had been championed for for many, many uh, decades by Alice Mayhew, who was who was one of Simon and Schuster's great editors and worked with so many of our authors, including um, Walter Isaacson. Um, she edited a Pulitzer Prize uh, winning um, uh, uh, series by um, Taylor Branch on Martin Luther King. Um, anyway, Alice, um, Alice had been Bob Woodward's editor for a long time. We worked on Fear together, and then I was the editor of Rage. And, um, and obviously, these were Bob Woodward's books on the Trump administration. Um, he's, he's covered every president since Richard Nixon. Um, and he is, a, is sort of an, a walking encyclopedia of the ways of Washington and, and presidential power. And he has the context and the repertorial chops to, um, to figure out how to tell any story he decides is worth telling. And, um, and what's, so, what's so amazing about Bob is that um, it's just pure integrity and trust there. He, his sources trust him, and he tells the story in a way that um, allows, uh, allows him to get what he needs in order to give the readers an idea of what was really happening in the room. And somehow he manages to do that without burning his sources, which is hard to do. Um, and I think that really speaks to his probity um, and his uh, and his his own uh, his own dedication to getting the facts right. How about what happened, Hillary Clinton's book, another major title that you worked very closely on? Yes, I I, I have had the pleasure to uh, work on several books by Hillary Clinton, and um, she uh, she wrote what happened after she lost the election in 2016, and um, the title was an attempt to answer that question um, and to also explain what happened. And um, I worked on that with Priscilla Painton, one of our best editors. And, um, and again, that was, a, that was a case of getting to ask her all the questions we had about what it was like to be the first um, woman to, to have um, the nomination of a major political party and come so, so close to the presidency and, 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 and to then see it all end the way it did. And, um, it's a, I think it's a book that people are going to be reading for a very long time because it really does take you inside the experience of running for president. It also uh, explains the continuing challenges that women face um, and, and, the, and the sexism and misogyny that really remains endemic to our political process. John, you also you, we've already mentioned the the biography or autobiography of of Senator Ted Kennedy, but you also worked with Senator John McCain, and I'm curious, you know, talk about lions of the Senate. Um, did they have as much in common as they as they differed with on on policy issues? They really did have a lot in common, and I have to say, um, I I loved working with both of them. I remember with with Senator Kennedy. We were, we were having lunch one afternoon while we were working on the manuscript, and he started talking about some cuts that President Reagan had made to um, uh, aid to, uh, to working families. And you know, this was decades ago uh, in, in the past that, that, he, that this had happened, and Senator Kennedy was still upset about it. Um, so I, I could see that there was like real passion there. And that was also true for, for John McCain. He was, he was somebody who just loved to, to, um, to be in the arena. He was, uh, he was uh, absolutely committed to doing what he thought was right. 
Um, he was not, uh, you know, he, he, there was no self-interest there. I mean, when we had lunch, he would pay. Um, he didn't want any conflicts of interest. Um, and, uh, and, you know, he, he never, he never actually um, called me about um, small things. Uh, in fact, he hardly ever called me at all. I remember once he called me because he thought there was a, a, a dissident in the former Soviet Union who, we th who, we, who he thought we should be publishing. Yeah. And I thought it was so interesting that out of all the times that he wanted to talk to me, that was what he wanted to talk to me about. Another time, he wanted to make sure that we gave enough credit to his collaborator, Mark Salter. And I did seven books with John McCain, and he was the personification of character. He was a great American. So that brings to mind, uh, and I didn't know this until we were corresponding before the show, that you did a couple, you edited a couple of books many years ago by Donald Trump. <laughs> now, there's a contrast between the people we've been talking about. Talk about that. Yes, um, I, I in the in the 1990s, so a long, long time ago, um, <laughs> Random House had published The Art of the Deal. And so uh, when it was time, he wanted to write The Art of the Comeback. And I was a young editor. And and so I, I was um, I was given the opportunity to work on that. And then when The Apprentice was first coming out the first season, we did a book with uh, with Donald and uh, and he had a, he actually had a sign on his desk that said the buck starts here. And I thought that would actually be a good title. And he said, no, 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 no. I want to call it How to Get Rich. How to Get Rich. <laughs> it's very direct. I mean, see, he always knew what he wanted. I got to say, working with him was a lot of fun. He, uh, he would, uh, he would uh, go to book signings. He'd autograph dollar bills for people online. People really liked him. He liked people. I had no idea he had those kinds of presidential aspirations at the time. It was purely about sort of the, uh, the carnival of working with Donald Trump. And uh, I was very surprised by the uh, turn of events that his life took. I have to say, at the, at the same time I was working with Donald Trump, I was also doing a memoir by Donna Summer, the queen of disco. And if you had asked me at the time which of them would become president of the United States was more likely, I would have probably said it was more likely that Donna Summer would have been president of the United States because she was at least queen of disco. She would have been elected. So, uh, you know, the whole oh, that's thing hilarious. took me by surprise. So uh, very quickly, you've started a book recommendation series uh, called The Word According to Carp. Love the pun. Tell us quickly about that. And then in the minute or two we have left, maybe you can talk about some upcoming titles from Simon Schuster. But anyway, The Word yes. According Four to minutes, Carp. Four minutes, but who's counting? Yep. Uh, who's counting? Well, thank you for asking. Uh, I decided that I have such passion for these books and I'm reading them that it would just be fun for me to talk about them for just two or three minutes. Um, so they're on YouTube, The Word According to Carp, and uh, you can find them there. And um, it's just uh, my, my favorite Simon & Schuster books every, you know, and I'm doing, you know, I'm doing probably, uh, you know, a few, a few every month. And um, it's just a chance for me to enthuse about them. And we've got, um, we've got a book by Sebastian Junger coming out um, in May called Freedom. Um, and a book by um, uh, Brad Stone about called Amazon Unbound, which is inside uh, Jeff Bezos's world, which is absolutely fascinating. And um, and you know each you know so each you know each week I'm trying to find a book that I think is worthy of being uh, enthused about and uh, just letting readers know about them. So the other black girl is a title coming uh, in June, and you describe it as one of the most talked about first novels of the year. Give us a little bit of detail on that one. Yes, there normally uh, there are articles written in advance of publication, and this is definitely one. I mean, everybody the, from the BBC to Time magazine have said this is one of the most anticipated books of the year. It's by a first time writer named Zakia Harris, um, the other black girl, and it's about being black and working in an office. And the other black girl is the, the second black woman to come and work in this pretty white environment. And so it's it's about race and paranoia and uh, and social justice and it's set um in the professional world. And I think that it's just the right book at the right time for all of us who are sort of having these very uh you know sober and serious conversations about how to talk about race. This is a novel that explodes the, those conversations in the most suspenseful and entertaining way. It's very funny too. Um, so uh, I think that it's, uh, you know, some people are comparing it to the to the Devil Wears Prada, some people are comparing it to The Firm, um, but it's just, I think, a book that a lot of people are going to be reading. It's going to be coming out in June. 
Sounds like somebody we should have on our show, Jim. I she's, would agree. She's brilliant. She's a brilliant woman, I, and she's you know I think you you would like her. Remember her name, Zakia Harris. Yeah, we will for sure. John, what uh, we've got just literally about a minute left here. You know, how when did you fall in love with books? Oh gosh, well actually, uh, probably uh, when I was in high school, I read The World According to Garp. Uh, John <laughs> Irving, I, he is my of course, you did. I, it, it, it rendered me uh, into tears. I remember exactly which couch I was sitting on when I finished it. It was late at night. And, um, and I, you know, I come from a family. I mean, both of my parents are big readers. So there were always books around the house. And, um, and I've just always loved to read. So uh, when, you know, Philip Roth's Goodbye Columbus was another one, uh, Bernard Malamud, The Assistant, there were a bunch of novels that I read. And then I, then I really got interested in journalism and people like David Halberstam and Robert Carroll, Bob Woodward's, all of Bob Woodward's books were on my shelf as a kid. And I remember, you know, I read The Brethren in college, and that was a transformative reading experience for me, explained the politics of the legal system in a way that um, even the college course I was taking didn't. So, you know, it, it was a great, it was just a, a great time to, uh, to be coming of age and reading. And, uh, and so when I, when I left uh, journalism, newspaper journalism, I decided that I wanted to work in books. Well, we're all the better for it. Uh, yeah, Jonathan okay. Carr, that is all the time we have this week, but thank you so much for being with us. If you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. Mm -hmm.